All right, so this week we are talking all about chapter eight, which covers arrays in quite a bit of detail. So it's a very useful programming concept that I think will be really valuable for you all to learn. We're covering uh, 8.1 and part of 8.2 from the focus on the concepts uh, part of this chapter. Uh, the rest of 8.2 will be covered in the next video. All right, so most of what we've seen so far uh, in terms of data is what's known as a scalar value or a simple value, which we store in a scalar or simple variable, and it holds exactly one value. So your any of your numbers are going to be scalar, for example. Um, they are associated with one memory location, exactly one. Uh, in the case of things like the numeric data types, the integers, doubles, and decimals, uh, the, that memory location is actually going to be of a fixed size. But, you know, it is associated with exactly one memory location. An integer variable only holds one integer, right? You can change what that integer's value is, but in the end it's only holding one single integer. And it also has one variable name. So, when you create a, um, integer variable using the dimension statement, for example, uh, you assign a name to that memory location and are creating the variable in that way. So you associate one name with that one single memory value. Arrays, on the other hand, hold multiple values, and we'll talk about this more, but they actually hold multiple values of the same type. So an array actually groups together multiple memory locations that are all of the same type. They're grouped together because they serve some related purpose where it makes sense for them to be connected. Uh, and they're also laid out sequentially and they're given some kind of ordering. ordering. So it's not... When you have a uh, scalar variable, you have a name associated with one single locker in some storage room, right? With an array, you have a whole line of lockers that are all grouped under the name of this array. So the uh, name of the array actually refers to all of them. And then we have ways of actually indicating which specific locker within this whole group, within this array that we actually want to talk about. Now the thing about an array, I kind of just mentioned this, is that it has one variable name. So a variable can be an array variable, uh, which references this array that has multiple memory locations, each with its own value in it. So, you know, holding multiple values. Uh, and in order to get a specific value outside of this array, you have to uh, use the subscript or the... Um, index to identify that value's position in the array. So the name of the variable identifies the array itself and then the subscript identifies which um, position, like which actual value within the array you're trying to get out of it. Uh, now when we're actually talking about arrays, the proper term is subscript. Uh, index refers to something else, like a collection, sort of like the item collections actually that we have talked about for list boxes or whatever. Um, an index would, re would refer to that more correctly, but it kind of gets into semantics. They're usually referred to pretty interchangeably these days, but um, an array subscript would be the proper term. The subscript identifies that value's position in an array. Now I want to make a note here, the textbook says that an array holds multiple variables, but that's not really correct. Um, a variable itself is just, you know, a, a variable itself is a lot more abstra abstract. Um, it'd be more correct to say that an array groups together multiple memory locations. Um, side by side, it can hold multiple values in that way. And then a variable can actually refer to an array. So you can have an array variable as opposed to a scalar variable. 
However, I did want to bring up that note because the textbook might say, you know, that an array holds multiple variables, just be on the lookout for that, but that's not actually correct. In chapter 7, we talked about strings being a lot like character arrays, where um, they actually group together all of these individual characters into a larger thing that we're then passing around. So for example, stir city is a variable that we could think of as referring to this array of characters like this. One variable, multiple characters, and we index into it to get the individual characters out of there. So strings do hold an array of characters. Uh, all of those characters are related to each other in the sense that they all form the city name Santa Maria in this example. And they also have a proper ordering, because if I shuffled these characters around in any other possible ordering, it might not be clear what they are actually referring to. So they have a very specific ordering that makes a lot of sense for this um, city name, right? But I could take these same characters, I could type them in a different ordering, you know, completely different ordering, but it would still be ordered in some way. I could even type them out alphabetically or reverse alphabetically. Those would all be orderings, but no matter what, they will be typed out in some order. I just get to choose what order I put all these characters in. And then variable string city points to the array holding the values, and then you uh, refer to individual characters by indexing in. Or, like I said before, with an array, it's more proper to actually use the term subscript. So uh, at subscript three, we have the letter T as a character, for example. The thing is, is that strings aren't actually arrays of characters. They're not arrays of the char data type. Uh, they have a lot more functionality. For example, um, strings, you can insert things into them or you can remove things out of them. You can change the size of strings, which is actually something you're not easily able to do with arrays. You have to do something called, uh, or use something called the redim statement, but we're not going to worry about that right now. But arrays typically you don't change the size of. They're fixed size completely, and you are using them in instances where you know exactly what size you need. But strings, have a lot more flexibility because you can add things into them, take things out of them. You can actually do that kind of thing when uh, character arrays don't have that functionality. Also methods like to upper or replace or anything like that are not going to be present in an actual character array. But that actually touches on why we say indexing with strings instead of subscripting. I said subscripting was proper with arrays, but with strings, we always said indexing. The reason why is because strings are fundamentally a collection of characters. Sort of how list boxes have a collection of items. Strings also kind of have a collection of items. Their items are just uh, characters. So they actually are really similar in that sense. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of overlap conceptually between these collections, especially between strings and between actual arrays, which we will talk about. But there is a difference between a string and a character array, and probably 99% of the time you will want to use a string instead of a character array. I want to put that out there, but it's really helpful for us thinking about conceptually what an array is. Uh, the other thing I want to point out while I'm here is I want to keep in mind this idea of a linear uh, sequential collection of data right here, where all of these individual characters are laid out right next to each other in memory. Uh, that is the old-fashioned way of handling arrays, is laying them out right next to each other in memory. Whether that's still the case in more fancy, schmancy, complicated 
uh, programming languages like Visual Basic, I'm not as sure of anymore. But back in the days of assembly programming in C, that would be absolutely the case where they are literally located directly next to each other in memory like this. I think that's the intention of a lot of programming languages is to put them next to each other when they're a full on array like this. Funny enough, it's another difference between an array and a collection, but I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself at this point. All right, so let's actually create our own arrays. We're going to first focus on one dimensional arrays where data is very linearly laid out one piece of data right next to another in a line like this. Now we'll talk about two dimensional arrays later on, but that's a more complicated idea. And I want us to get more comfortable with one dimensional arrays first. So very quickly, this is an example of a one dimensional array because all of these values are laid out right next to each other like so. Um, I will say that you could, if you wanted to, if it's helpful, this isn't necessary at all, uh, but you could think of a scalar value, like an integer, one single integer or one single character or something like that as being a zero dimensional array because it's just the one value. So it's a lot more like a point. Whereas this is like a line segment that has some amount of length that's greater than just existing as a point by itself, right? Uh, if you want to think about it that way, if it's helpful for you, then by all means, feel free to do so. But that's not uh, necessary for this class. Just something that definitely helps me a lot is thinking about it in terms of zero dimensions. And it does actually help when you get into more complicated areas of programming, if you end up wanting to go in that direction. But that's not something we need to worry about just yet. Now to create our one dimensional array with um, probably at least two values in it, because why would you make an array of with only one value in it when you could just use a regular variable with only one value in it. Um, so you'll probably be having at least two values inside of your one dimensional array, but the way you do it is you type in dim. If you're making a, uh, procedure level array, you would uh, type private. If you're doing a class array, or static if you're doing a static array. But either of these will work. It doesn't matter if you type in dim, private, or static. Uh, any of those will work just fine. And I believe this also does work with the const keyword if you want to make it a constant. But you would then type the array name the same way that you would type a variable name. However, Instead of just going onto the data type, after you type the array name, you put in the max index or the max subscript of your array in parentheses afterwards, almost as if you were calling a function, but instead of calling a function, you're just uh, putting in the highest index number or the highest subscript number of your array. And that actually tells Visual Basic that you are creating an array. If you left out the parentheses whatsoever, it would think that you were creating a regular uh, variable, you know, scalar variable. If you put the parentheses with the highest index in, it will think that you're creating an array. And then you do as data type, the same way you would if you're doing a normal scalar variable. Now I talked about how you're typing in the highest index number in here, um, which is a, maybe a little counterintuitive because you might think that you're trying to put in the number of values you actually want in the array, the length of the array, right? But you actually have to put in the highest index of the array, which is actually the length minus one. So if I typed the number four in 
for max index, it would create an array of five numbers, which is a little bit strange. And I think this is the first language I've heard of that has a that actually does this. But that is the rules of the game that we play in Visual Basic. But it will create an array of, uh, you know, it, it, that groups together max index plus one values uh, of the type um, data type, whatever data type you choose to have there. So it sets aside enough memory for however many of these values of that particular type, whether they are all integers or all doubles or whatever. Um, max index is the highest index and subscript value, like I said. All of those entries are going to be initialized to their default values. So if I chose um, integer as the data type, they would all be initialized to zero. If I chose Boolean as the data type, they would all be initialized to false. For example, if I was creating a procedure level array called double grades, I give it four as the max index or the max uh, subscript number, and then I use double as the type. This is what that statement would look like. Dim double grades passing in four as double. Uh, and it would create an array with five um, memory locations grouped together, all next to each other in memory. Uh, and all of those would be doubles. So at subscript zero, we have a double. At subscript one, we have a double and so on and so forth. And they all are initialized to their default value of 0, 0.0. Now, just like we have the ability to initialize our scalar variables to a particular number, uh, we are also able to initialize the values contained in our array to particular values if we so choose. And the syntax for that looks a little bit different, but it's not too dissimilar from what we just saw before. Now, um, what happens here? This is a notation that the textbook uses, and unfortunately, it's a little bit confusing. These curly braces right here represent a choice where I'm either putting in dim, private, or static, right? Uh, we've seen that kind of stuff before. But these curly braces on the other side of the equal sign uh, actually do need to be typed out. So you will need to type out these ones on the right side of the equal sign, where you hold this init values thing, but you don't type out the curly braces over here. You just choose either dim or private or static to put before your array's name. So I want to give that heads up. But what you do is you uh, start out declaring the array as before. You put the parentheses after the name of the array, but you don't actually put the maximum subscript value in there. You just leave it blank. You just put empty parentheses as if you were calling a, a uh, procedure with no arguments in it. And then it goes as normal as data type equals. And then within your curly braces, you set all of the initial values that you want to put into the slots in your array in order separated by commas. So all of the values in here are going to get thrown into the array in the order that you type them and you have to separate them by you know commas and spaces or you can also hit enter or all that kind of stuff following the syntax rules for hitting enter in the middle of a line that we talked about a few chapters back uh the length rather than being determined by the number you put into the parentheses will instead be determined by the number of values you actually type between the curly braces so you don't need to worry about matching those two values correctly you can just type in the values that you want to put in there, and that will just be the length of the array. Um, all of the values that you type in must be of the type data type, or it must be possible to convert those values to the correct data type with all of the option statements in place. So for example, you should be able to, if you're trying to make an array of doubles, you can still type in integers, and that's fine because they can get promoted to doubles, right? But if you're trying to make an array of integers, you can't type in a whole bunch of doubles because that would 
uh, interfere with the option statements and Visual Basic would get very mad. So you, the, uh, you know, the promotion, demotion, all that type of stuff, all of those rules, the typecasting rules in general, um, have to correctly be applied in order for the initial values to be seen as valid. But otherwise, if you can get all the initial values to be converted to the data type, or if they already are of that data type, then that's totally fine. And this method is called populating the array. You're actually, um, you can imagine the previous method as building an empty city. And then eventually you move people in and all that kind of stuff. But this is called populating the array because you build up a city full of houses and all that kind of stuff and fill the people in right away, if that makes sense. So here's another example of this double grades um, array right here. Uh, I'm creating a array of doubles. Um, I do not specify the maximum index or subscript number, but instead I specify four value, sorry, five values between the curly braces on the right side of the equal sign. And those values are put in to double grades in order. So the first value, the integer 90, becomes the double 90.0 and is put into subscript zero. Uh, 73.5, the second value gets put into subscript one and so on and so forth. And you see this example of me um, promoting a couple integers into doubles for the sake of what I'm doing right here. Now, I want to make a note about the names of arrays right here. You might have seen that I continue to use type IDs for array variables, uh, even though, you know, the arrays are actually very different than um, the scalar types themselves. A double array is very different than a double. Even if the double array had a length of one, it only had one double in it, that array is actually still very different from a double itself because that array has other things going on that a regular double doesn't have. But nonetheless, I'm still using the same type IDs. So a double array gets the type ID dbl, as does a scalar double. Um, the difference that I want to make between my array names and my scalar names is that I want to make sure that the array names explicitly reflect the fact that they contain multiple values. So having them be plural, for example, like double grades instead of double grade. Uh, and I also sometimes might use words that indicate that they're a collection of values, like collection or group or something like that, or even array, if I so choose. Array is actually probably a very good one to explicitly put in your name, like grade array or something like that. I could do, you know, double class grades or something if I wanted to say this is the grades, these are the grades for all of my class sort of indicate this grouping of multiple things, right? That's just a, a point on how to make, you know, it's, it's part of that larger point of trying to make your variable names very descriptive so that anyone looking at them can actually see what's going on in your code, especially me when I'm grading your code, please. It makes my life a lot easier when I can tell what your variables are doing, but, um, this is especially going to be helpful uh, if you're able to explicitly differentiate between your variables that are scalar and your variables that are arrays. All right, so we can work with arrays in a similar way that we can work with the individual characters in a string. Uh, with arrays, you can actually store data into the different um, memory locations contained within them. So the first line right here, double grades at subscript zero equals 90. What I'm doing is I'm taking the memory location at subscript zero, throwing out whatever value used to be in there. I don't care what's used to be in there. It's now going to be uh, 
90. And while I actually take that value 90 and I put it into double grades at, at uh, subscript zero. So I can't say double grades equals 90. That would be incorrect because double grades is supposed to hold an entire array. Uh, I can't put just the scalar value 90 in there. I have to specify which subscript of double grades is actually going to get the value 90. Um, in a similar way, we can say string cities at subscript 3 gets the string Santa Maria, which is totally fine. However, um, something that I had mentioned is that arrays usually hold uh, values of a fixed size, I believe. Um, but the thing about that is that strings are not of a fixed size. They could have any number of characters within them, and the number of characters within them can actually change. So if arrays are fixed size, they shouldn't be able to hold a string, except for the fact that when you put a string into an array, you're not actually cramming the string itself into the array. It works a little bit like how pass by reference does, where um, when you pass by reference a variable into a procedure, uh, that procedure doesn't get the value inside of the variable, but it rather gets the directions to how to get to the to that variable's value. It kind of gets the name or the address or something like that. Uh, and this is actually working in a similar way. Uh, a string array like this doesn't actually get the string, but a string array holds a whole bunch of addresses to each of the strings associated with that array. And all of those addresses are going to be the same size. So that's how that part of it works, but that's a uh, more of a fun fact for you. And then we have uh, the example of double prices at uh, subscript four, and I use the arithmetic assignment operator, uh, the multiplication equality operator, I suppose, to take the value that was in the uh, fourth subscript of double prices, multiply it by three, and then put that new value back into the fourth subscript there. So you can actually use the uh, assignment operators that actually you know, modify the existing value. So any of the arithmet arithmetic ones, as well as the uh, concatenation one, you can use. All right, now this is another example of storing data, but I've written an entire program instead of three individual lines like this. What I'm doing is I'm writing a program that gives the user the 10th Fibonacci number, um, or I guess the ninth Fibonacci number, technically speaking. Um, now this would be more useful as a program if the user was able to specify what the uh, size of the array was to be. Um, there's probably a way to make that happen cleanly. I didn't feel like going to the trouble, uh, but you absolutely can do it. So let's see. The first thing I do is I uh, create my array, int fibs, which holds 10 integers. The maximum subscript is nine, so it holds 10, since we start counting at zero, as integer. And then I populate the, uh, the first two slots in my array with the, technically the zeroth Fibonacci number and the first Fibonacci number. Uh, normally we think about the first two Fibonacci numbers, which are both one, right? But the zeroth Fibonacci number is also a uh, base case that we can use for the Fibonacci numbers. And then if I add the zero and first Fibonacci numbers, I get zero plus one equals one, which is the second Fibonacci number. So it, it all works anyway, right? And when you do it this way, the, um, the actual number of the Fibonacci number lines up perfectly with the subscript of the array. So it's a really nice way of thinking about it. When I go to the ninth subscript of the array, then that means I have the ninth uh, Fibonacci number. 
makes it real easy. But what I do here is I put the first two values in the array, in the first two uh, slots of the array, and then I run a for loop from positions two to nine of the array because I've already handled positions zero and one, and I need you know positions zero and one to be my base case in order to start generating the new one. So I really can only start my calculations at position two, right? But what I'll do is uh, I'll try to calculate first the second, then the third, then the fourth, and so on until I calculate the ninth. That's what this uh, int fib num is going to specify right here is which Fibonacci number I'm actually currently calculating. And then for every Fibonacci number, I essentially set the um, the value of my array at that current position, the current position that I'm looking at, to be equal to the previous Fibonacci number, which is at the slot directly before it, added to the number before that, which is two slots before the current one that I'm looking at. That's also why I want to start at two right here, because eventually I'm going to look at you know, the index, current index that I'm looking at, minus two, if I started at one or at zero, I would uh, run into a lot of problems. That would end up being a runtime error like that. So I want to start it at two specifically because I'm doing this, I'm looking at uh, two indices before the current index number, and I want to make sure that that is a valid index the whole time. But I just do that calculation. So the second Fibonacci number is equal to the first Fibonacci number plus the zeroth Fibonacci number, set that into the second position. Then the third is going to be equal to the second plus the first, set that to the third position. Then the fourth will be equal to the third plus the second, set that to the fourth position, and so on and so forth. I uh, correctly set the ninth position, then infant num becomes 10, uh, steps out of the range of this uh, or loop. And then I just display the last element in the array, which is equal to the length minus one. There's also another way we can get that, but that way is a lot more typing, so I didn't feel like doing it. But I'll show it off in a sec. So I just take that last value, which is the um, length of the array minus one, convert that to a string and zero since it's an integer, and then set that into the text of some label. All right, so there are two array methods and properties that I want to focus on right now. First is the length uh, property, which you have seen before in strings and the item collections as well. Uh, this gives the number of values in this array. It just works exactly the same. You would do um, array name dot length, and that gives you an integer value that will be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, probably in almost every single case greater than zero, in almost every single case greater than one even, so at least two, but you'll get a non-negative integer no matter what. Now there's also this get upper bound method right here, and you'll see that I have put a zero. Get upper bound is complicated. We don't have to worry about most of that complication, I can just tell you that if you have a one-dimensional array and you call the get upper bound method and pass in zero, it will give you the highest subscript of your array, which will be equal to the length minus one. But it always has to be zero for one-dimensional arrays. There are times where we will put something that isn't zero into this method. I'll talk about that later. But when you use a one-dimensional array, it has to be zero. Anything else will give you an error. Uh, for example, if we take a look at the double grades uh, example array that I gave before, which I declared to have um, four as the highest subscript number in the first example where I created it, or where I um, initialized it with five values in total, right? Um, 
In either case, the length of double grades here was 5. I always made sure that it would have 5 values in it. The highest subscript would be 4. If I wanted to get the number 4, for example, if I wanted to directly reference the last, um, the last value in the array double grades, then what I could do is I could do double grades dot get upper bound pass in the number zero and this whole thing would return four, which then gets put into int highest sub. So that is the highest subscript in double grades. Like I talked about before, this is equivalent to saying dot length minus one. So double grades dot length minus one would give five minus one, which is four, which is marginally less efficient, but it really doesn't matter. And maybe the slightly less amount of typing will do you a lot more good right here. Um, when it comes to one dimensional arrays, using dot length and using get upper bound, those respective ways of getting the final subscript or index of this array, either one is totally fine. They will work exactly the same as each other. Uh, there are cases where the distinction does matter. Like I said, we'll uh, talk about that in just a little bit. All right, well, that is our primer on arrays. Um, we have a lot of really cool stuff to look forward to with talking about arrays. So I hope you are getting jazzed.